Hi, this is Eli Allen, and I'm going to do a YouTube video response in response to Chloe Everett's TED Talk on Applied Behavior Analysis ABA from someone who received the early intervention firsthand. So as you know, my name is Eli Allen. Um, I'm 27, and I live in West Boca Raton, Florida. I am high-functioning on the autism spectrum and has severe attention issues. My parents were also the first in Nassau County, New York, to successfully win a lawsuit against her school district to fund a 40-hour-per-week early intensive applied behavior analysis ABA home program, which enabled me to speak by the time I turned four and a half. I have my bachelor's degree in psychology, and I'm currently enrolled into an online master's program in disability policy making at the CUNY School of Professional Studies for the fall of 2021. I'm making this video to clarify the outdated misinformation on ABA among many in the high-functioning autism or ASD community as I experienced a high-quality program firsthand which was led by Dr. Bobby Newman, a renowned behavior analyst and psychologist who trained a staff of teachers to work with me when I was little. To begin, although the field of behavior analysis or ABA is most widely used as an early intervention for autism. It's actually a much broader field of B.F. Skinner's theory of operant conditioning and positive reinforcement. ABA is largely studied for a number of other subfields, including applied animal behavior, organizational behavior management, contact desensitization for phobias, which refers to systematic desensitization infused with shaping, as well as using financial vouchers for substance abuse, covert counter conditioning techniques like mindfulness and breathing and counseling, instructing the elderly with dementia, pediatric feeding therapy, diet and exercise, school-wide positive behavior support, as well as the early intervention for autism amongst many other fields. Um, in terms of behavior management or support, uh, we now look at the function behaviors such as attention seeking, escape slash avoidance, sensory stimulation, or tangible access to an item or activity. Once we assess and collect data on the function of the behavior, we then use differential reinforcement of alternative or other behaviors to replace and teach new behaviors or skills. When used as an early intervention for autism, some of the verbal and physical aversives you heard about that were employed in the discrete trial teaching sessions in the 1960s to early 80s are currently outdated and it is all based on positive reinforcement now. Back when I had in 1998, which was called LOVAS therapy in those days, since LOVAS was the psychologist who developed discrete trials, there, there wasn't any averses. If you saw the videotapes of Bobby and my assistant teacher slash so babysitter Joel, who he trained to work with me, uh, they were he was making me laugh and giving me piggyback rides. I recall my parents and grandma told me they they used to call my name and hold a chocolate chip cookie to get me to look at people, imitate fine and gross motor behaviors like clapping hands and waving bye bye. And once I was able to respond to the to the command without the manual prompt, then they were they worked on teaching me speech. I recall my grandmother telling me to say cuff for cookie. Bobby would have me blow or feel the pressure of the breath. And of course, it was generalized with incidental teaching, which uses man request training. So I was able to understand what the word I was taught meant. After the ABA or early intensive behavior intervention program ended, which was the only therapy we tried that got me to speak, I continued to receive home-based speech therapy until I turned seven after the ABA program ended. To explain what Chloe meant when she said research now shows that ABA is not effective, first of all, um, I have to clarify that because that is not true. All forms of ABA, including discrete trials, incidental teaching, and pivotal response treatment are shown to be effective for, for children with autism. And she, like many other people, are mixing up discrete trials with ABA when it's just really one form of ABA. When man request training is used alone to elicit vocalizations for 25 hours per week without discrete trials as the primary teaching unit, it's called pivotal response treatment. And despite a common misconception, even among most researchers, incidental teaching was always used. Even in the, Lovas used it even in the 60s. It, it was always done that way. 
But the reason why research is now showing that children are learning faster through pivotal response treatment or the man request training without discrete trials is because most diagnosed have expressive instead of receptive language delays because um, the diagnostic criteria, as Bobby pointed out, widened to include much more higher functioning forms of the disorder. So for those who have receptive language delays like I had, the inattention is more profound. And I know from my research, it shows that they aren't able to learn without the discrete trials. It's considered best practice now just to have the child man first, but if the child is still distracted and zones out, then that means they need 30 to 40 hours per week of discrete trials to learn speech. I've also noticed when doing an internship in an ABA oral intervention classroom in Long Island, New York years ago, that there are a range of different learning styles, but they were all able to learn either through discrete trials or man training. And that went with the speech as well. Another thing I wanted to point out is while proponents claim that ABA, proponents who are against ABA, um, they claim that they still don't, well, like a number of things, including they still don't target relationship building with adults. Um, that's not true anymore. While I wasn't socially withdrawn from adults like most kids on the autism spectrum were, what I did like is that ABA evolved with what's known as social responsivity or reciprocal imitation training, where they follow the child's restricted interests and lead into play by using them as natural reinforcers. It also reminded me of the Greenspan floor time approach but I've always found that technique to help a child who's isolated, and I'm glad ABA had widened to accept this over the years. Also, when some parents complain that the therapy made the child robotic, it's because the therapist isn't well-trained. For example, at my former um, private special education middle and high school that, for, that was for very high-functioning and bright kids, um, which I attended for 10 years, a girl told me her younger cousin at ABA initially didn't like or do well from it, but when we moved up to the high school, her cousin received a home ABA program by another therapist, and he actually did very well from it. And the therapist told the family, whoever was previously running his ABA home program was clearly not well-trained, and had he received a home ABA program by well-trained behavior analysts when he was younger, he probably would have been able to come a longer way in his development. Um, another thing I wanted to clear up um, that was discussed in that TED Talk in, uh, video, in response to the gay conversion ex therapy experiment in the 1970s, it's currently against the Behavior Analyst Certification Board's guidelines to ever use ABA in the form of gay conversion therapy or to otherwise try to convert someone's sexual orientation. The FDA also permanently banned the use of aversive electric shock treatment in March 2020, and that one boarding school in Massachusetts no longer uses them as a result. And while I like how Chloe in that video quoted Dr. Temple Grandin, who is probably the most famous adult with high-functioning autism who's quite successful as an adult, um, how she quoted her on embracing differences, but even Grand who highly endorses ABA, noted the speech therapy program she received as a young girl back in the late 1940s consisted a lot of what's seen in high-quality ABA programs today. And as I mentioned, she highly endorses it as well. And I forgot who it was, but I believe it was also Tempo Grand who said in a lecture once that while she's just for the neurodiversity movement, as, it, as is everyone else from the high-functioning autism community, what a lot of them don't realize, especially the ones who advocate against ABA, is that there are kids who are more profoundly afflicted than they are who need 40 hours per week of that intervention to get the speech going. Anyway, I thought it was important that I shared this since ABA is a science, the therapy gave me a voice, and the research shows that it works. Therefore, I'm pro-ABA.